Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 23 years of law enforcement analysis experience. She's spent time as a records management and as a crime analysis supervisor. She is currently the co-chair of the IACA Conference Speaker Committee. She's a California girl spending her days in Oregon dealing with marijuana legalization issues. Please welcome Danielle Martel. Danielle, how are we doing? Great. How are you? I am doing very well. So thank you for joining me. And let's uh, just jump right in. How did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? Back in my 20s, when I was doing archaeology, after I got my degree, my bachelor's degree in anthropology, I got a flyer from Cal State Fullerton that advertised the crime analysis certificate program. Sounded very interesting to me. That was always kind of a minor in college for me. So I decided to look into it because quite honestly, working as an archaeologist was a very unreliable profession, I would say. It was also (laughs) extremely physical. So it just didn't offer a whole lot of stability for me. I loved doing it, but I wanted something more stable for the future. So I decided to check out the crime analysis certificate program, signed up for some classes. And pretty much once I took my first class, I was hooked and decided to keep going. Yeah, that's so funny. I just recently had Jim Mallard on and he was an anthropology major. And he pretty much said the same thing, that he wasn't sure where it was going, so he wanted something more stable. So it's fascinating that I've known you two for probably about a decade or longer, and you, I had no idea that your majors were anthropology. So what was your first job then in law enforcement? So during the certificate program in California, you have to do your internship. So I did that at Huntington Beach, where I actually met a girl named Joanne, who later set me up with my first, I guess you would say, official paying job in law enforcement working for the INS. And we were both working on different cases. I was working on a terrorism case, and she was working on human trafficking. And so I was actually a contractor for the INS. So I didn't work directly for them. And that was my first taste. And it was more of an intel position. And it wasn't going to be a permanent position. So once a flyer came out for Westminster PD, that's when I started looking at that. But my first introduction was at INS. And it was a great experience because it was completely different than anything I had done before. And then you mentioned the certificate program. So how did the certificate program prepare you for this first gig? It was a, it was a really interesting program. And especially because we didn't have as much reliance on computers back then. Don't get me wrong. They were there, (laughs) but um, they've definitely come much further than when I started out, but it helped me with link analysis. So in more of a criminal investigator, I was looking into these terrorism links and some of the people that were helping these terrorists by making up fake documents, fake asylum stories, stuff like that. So I was able to go through some of these stories and parse out the information and put it into link analysis. And honestly, that class really helped me be able to do that. Interesting. What a fascinating first gig. It really was. And I later found out after I left that job that we actually worked on the first case that was prosecuted as individuals helping a terrorist organization. So the ASAC over at INS was kind enough to send that to me. So that felt pretty good that some of the work I did helped them be able to accomplish that. Were you kept in a dark in a way that you didn't really know the full scope of the investigation? You were only given a specific task? To some degree, but we actually worked with INS agents. And then we also had FBI agents and 
every once in a while we would go up to LA and also talk to the AUSA about the case. So I had a pretty good understanding of the case. I'm sure there was some stuff because I had a secret clearance, but I didn't have like my ASAC had, which was, you know, top secret clearance. So I'm sure mm-hmm. there's some stuff I didn't get to see, but they included me in a lot of it. So that was a, that was a nice start for my career of learning how to do link analysis and working cases with different agencies too. You mentioned that it wasn't long-term. Was it just a, a temporary contract position? It was. And they offered me actually another contract after that one ended. But like I said, I was I was really looking for some permanent position. I, I really just didn't want to do the moving around and stuff. And sometimes I kind of regret that because seeing more of the country would have been cool. But mm-hmm. uh, I was really a Southern Cali girl. So <laughs> I ended up going to Westminster, but they did offer me another position. And I just chose to stay more local to where I was living. Yeah. And where is Westminster? Westminster is next to Stanton. It's next to Huntington Beach. It's kind of in central Orange County. Um, It's one of the hugest populations of Vietnamese. It it has a place called Little Saigon there. And a lot of people from the Vietnam War came and settled there. So it's it's an interesting city with a very diverse culture, but it's only about 110,000 people. So then you start here at Westminster and as a records manager, right? Actually, I started as the crime analyst, their first crime oh, analyst. Okay, great, and great. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it just, uh, that's how I started. But I ended up, they had a lot of issues with data and databases. And honestly, from my archaeology days, I had learned databases. And so I had a pretty good understanding of what some of the issues were. Mm -hmm. And when the position came open that I could do, I could supervise records and crime analysis, I decided to take that on. And that's how I became the record supervisor. But for about a year and a half, I was the crime analyst. You only had a year and a half there as an analyst, and then you became the records manager. Were you still doing crime analysis type tasks? Whenever I could, but I had a great analyst named Julie Romano, who now works at Huntington Beach. And so she really got things started where I didn't. And so we worked together, though. I would still take mapping classes. And so it was nice to still keep my skills up and help her out when I could. But a big focus for me was more of the records position because it's just, it's very encompassing. And I had several employees. And so luckily, Julie was very autonomous and could do almost anything without a whole lot of help. From your perspective, I could see there be an advantage from managing both records and the crime analysis unit. Oh, absolutely. Because we still were relying on a person to do UCRs, of course. And unfortunately, at Westminster, the person doing it was uh, critically injured and didn't come back to work. And so I got that job and kept it and didn't want Julie to have that when she became the crime analyst because I had it as the crime analyst. And I wanted to keep that so that she could focus more on actual analysis. But I think it was really good because I could see how the records department, what they did affected crime analysis and the data she got. So I'm actually really glad I did that. It taught me a lot about how to put data in properly because, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And so that was a primary goal of mine was to keep it clean data. Do you have any specific examples of some of the issues that you were dealing with at this time in terms of the data? People did not understand how to enter into a database. So a lot of times they would skip stuff or force stuff into into categories. And we all know how that is. And the RMS system didn't necessarily stop some of that. Amazingly, some people found some clever ways to get data in there that I never even knew you could (laughs) enter. Uh, So you know how that goes. But people had never used a computer before to enter police reports. Westminster was one of the first ones in Orange County, actually. And so it was a lot of a learning curve and then not understanding what they did really affected how you got information out. And I went to Crystal Reports training through the RMS company and learned how to run some queries and realized how much data was missing because you could see it on the back end. And that is really where both Julie and I worked towards getting better data in there because in the long run, it was going to help her, the investigators, everybody. Yeah. 
what was most effective for getting that? Because that's a challenge for a lot of departments is getting officers or other data entry folks to make sure that the data gets in there correctly. I hate to say it, but I had a nickname of the uh, records Nazi. Um, <laughs> that I was on top of the patrol and detectives and records. And I really did a lot of quality control. And yes, a lot of people did not like me because of that. (laughs) But again, it was important for us to have good data. So I actually was given the permission to kick things back to officers or to fix minor problems with their reports, you know, phone numbers, stuff like that in order for us to get it done. And luckily I had the support of command staff to do that because they really wanted accurate data too. So it it took a while and finally people started getting used to it and they got better with the system and I had to send out less nasty grams as they called them. So that was, (laughs) um, it took a while though. Yeah, I can imagine. So then you move on from here to go to Anaheim. So let's talk about that transition. So I was looking for something different, just a new challenge, and I applied for the first crime analysis supervisor position at Anaheim PD. They didn't have a formal division. They had two individuals who were doing crime analysis work, but they weren't called analysts, and they were called a criminal research specialist. They decided they wanted to expand it. And a big part of that was because of John Welter, the chief at Anaheim. He had come from San Diego. And he had worked with Julie Wartell. And so he really wanted analysis to be part of Anaheim. So I applied, got the position and began starting some training and doing different stuff. One of the ladies retired. So I really only had the other one, Dee, who stuck around for a while. (laughs) She was getting close to retirement too, but she was, she was a great help at getting me started and seeing what she knew about the systems, how she got information. So it really would have been a lot tougher if she hadn't been around. Yeah. So that's an interesting situation that you find yourself in. So you're new to Anaheim, you're coming in as a manager, you have one person retiring, the other one just about to retire. I'm guessing that Anaheim is bigger than Westminster. Yes, it has more crime. It's definitely bigger. They had 400 officers compared to the maybe 100 that Westminster had. Definitely more crime, bigger area to cover. So it was much more involved. And again, you know, I had to then get used to they had a brand new RMS system, too. It feels like every time I go to a job, it's a new system (laughs) that you have to learn. So learning that was my priority. And luckily, I had two officers that were doing the training that really listened to what I had to say as far as, hey, make sure that we're getting good data when you're training these people, tell them why, give them some information like that. So they really pounded that in as much as they could. So that helped. And then honestly, having Welter as a huge proponent, he gave me all the tools and resources that he could. I mean, you didn't always have money to get that stuff, but he was very Mm -hmm. supportive. And so he got a lot of captains and lieutenants to help me out on my process to getting people. And of course, I ended up with somehow the UCR program. Again, that wasn't supposed to be part of my job, but it was until I got it finally switched back to records. But I, you know, I was fine. The lady that I helped out get her going, she already knew UCR. So I was just more of a support system for her to make sure she got what she needed. I was able to hire someone that worked with D. And then after she retired, we got another person. So at least we, you know, Michael Rainey was my first official hire at Anaheim PD. He's now up in uh, Northern California, but he was a great addition and it started coming along slowly, but surely. Okay. So then as you're starting out, you have your own growing pains, but as a supervisor, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish First couple of years was just getting people, I think, to trust us and Mm -hmm. to realize that we were there to help them. So it was a lot of time spent explaining what we could do, how we could help them, not just with a specific case, but also with community oriented problems as far Mm -hmm. as problem neighborhoods or problem locations. And so we had a lot of different functions that 
Welter was trying to achieve. So we really had to show and prove to people, you know how that is, make sure they understood that we were there to help them. A lot of my job was more, I wouldn't say administrative because I did do stuff I would consider more traditional crime analysis, but I worked a lot more with the supervisors to try and get them data for a lot of their projects for the chief. We had a little bit of what you would call Comstat. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as hardcore. People weren't called out on the carpet too much for stuff, but we would go over. That was a big thing for Welter was get those meetings started. Let's go over where our crime is at, what's going on, what type of calls for service. So he very much wanted people to be invested in knowing what the calls and the crimes were, not just responding to the calls for service when they happen. So a lot of that was just getting people to understand and trust us that we could actually provide them with stuff that would help them out. I hear this a lot, just getting the buy-in. And most people just tell me, it's like, look, you start with a couple officers or supervisors a couple at a time use them as a showcase of what you can do. And then once you have a couple of success stories from there, it just kind of takes off, get more and more people buying in. Is that what you found as well? I agree with that. I mean, mine was a little bit different because I was a supervisor. So (laughs) Welder kind of forced some people to work (laughs) with me as far as our command staff. But we started, like you said, working with just small units, uh, maybe burglary, because they had a lot on their plate. You know, we'd start with some patrol officers that may not raise their hand in a briefing, but they'd come into our office and help us, ask us for some help. So it, yeah, it led to people who were complete believers. And then of course we had the non-believers who you can't tell me where crime is. I've worked here, you know, longer than you. I know what I'm doing. And at some point in your career, you say, okay, I am going to help the people who want my help. And of course I will do everything for administration because that's part of my job, but I wasn't going to keep forcing my analysts on people who didn't want help. So we really found that core group of people and it grew and grew over time that we were more than happy to help because we saw that it was helping them. So I think that's what most analysts need to learn is sometimes you're not going to change the minds of everybody and that's okay. Do your best for the people who are really want your help because they will be very appreciative of that. Good advice. So this brings us to your analyst badge story. And for those that may be new to the show, the analyst badge story is their career defining case or project that an analyst has worked on. And for you, it's during your time here in Anaheim dealing with a robbery series. Yes, I was actually a sole supervisor. Um, One of my analysts, Michael, had moved up north. And then the other analyst, Veronica, had taken a different position within the police department. So I was on my own, kind of doing the job of three people. And we had a robbery series of mainly liquor stores, a male adult that had a gun every time. And he was covering his gun up with a bandana and he hadn't used violence yet, but he was increasing his threats and just his demeanor when he was doing these robberies. We found out that Orange PD also had three in their city, which is right next to Anaheim also. So I started working on getting them, you know, I looked at the profile and figured out, I think this guy lives in Anaheim. He seems to know what, where he's at. So I started trying to look at stuff. Our officers had me give them every low budget, you know, low end budget motel. So that they go, go check and see that. Cause we kind of had some car descriptions. I also just kept running stuff through leads and doing different stuff. The detective was pulling his hair out, trying to find this man because he had a tattoo on his neck, but we didn't have the best description besides tattoo on his neck, male adult, Hispanic, possible age in his thirties. So I actually reached out to Irvine PD and had them run a geographic profile because we didn't have that software at the time. And I had taken the class, but I just didn't have the software. So they sent me over what they felt was one of the areas I should be concentrating on as far as geographics. And we had Crime View at the time that we had all our parolees, all our probationers, all our people entered in with their photos. So when I started looking at those people in those neighborhoods, I noticed a guy that really fit the bill. So I passed that information on to the sergeant of robbery. They went out, followed him, and ended up finding out that 
he actually committed a crime. And so they arrested him. But it was a great feeling to be able to find that. The unfortunate thing was, is we probably could have found him sooner, but parole leads never entered that he had the tattoo. So oh. that, you know, our poor detective was pouring through this stuff, <laughs> looking for this tattoo. And he had the tattoo when he was on parole, just someone didn't bother entering it. And so that was good that I was able to find it and had the photos in there and able to pare it down with the help of Irvine PD. So you know, it definitely goes with that garbage in, garbage out. And the detective that was in charge of it, he's kind of a, you know, he wasn't a surly guy, but he's a no nonsense kind of guy. And when he came back to work because he was ill and saw that the guy was arrested, he gave me a big hug. And I was like, wow, <laughs> he doesn't hug people. So <laughs> it was really nice to be able to help out with that. And I got a lot of high fives in the hallway and stuff when they arrested him. So it was a great moment as an analyst to know that I helped out. All right. Nice. And so you said he committed a crime. So were they following him and he committed a, a crime? Was it a different yeah, crime? Yeah, they actually were following him and he went into a liquor store and they ended up being able to see him pull out a gun, ended up arresting him. And so luckily no one was hurt or anything, but at the time they weren't completely sure it was him. And so unfortunately he did commit another robbery, but they were able to stop him. So that was good. Yeah, that's always can be a tough decision. Uh, you know, do you get him then or do you, you know, wait until he commits the crime? But, um, well, good work, man. I, I could just put myself in your shoes there, even the detective shoes, the frustration it would be because the first thing you would do in any search engine would be, oh, the guy has to have a neck tattoo. And so the fact that it wasn't put in the system automatically excluded that person from from all your results as you're searching. Yeah. And I actually did contact parole and let them know that this was a very specific case of, look, I get it. Everyone's busy, but this could have been, the series could have been shortened by quite a bit if we had been able to locate him sooner. And so, you know, hopefully they, they put in or took it to heart and put in some processes that they could try and, you know, double check some of this stuff. Because he did a great job photographing the tattoo. He just didn't put it into the system. And that's mm -hmm. more helpful than just photographs. Well, then you stay with Anaheim for 12 years, and then you've now made the transition to Oregon. So I guess just why make that transition from California to Oregon? My husband is a retired sergeant from Westminster PD. That's how we met. He was really just tired of California and not the <laughs> politics or anything like that. It's, it was more just, there's so many people, so much traffic. We both mountain bike. We were tired of it taking over an hour just to get to a local trail. That's really not even an hour away. So we decided a couple years before that at some point we were going to retire. We didn't know where, but we had been to Bend, Oregon. We loved it. We came up again to look at it the year before I retired. And so then we contacted a real estate agent and said, hey, send us any houses or land around this price range. And we'll start it, you know, for fun looking at them. And then we kind of got serious when I got the job flyer told my husband he goes we'll put in for it I go we haven't even decided to move um <laughs> what do you mean put in for it he goes just put in for it let's see and then we'll go up and go start looking at houses up there so I put in for the job it was on a grant and it basically said do you love dogs and do you love beer because Bend Oregon is for you and I said okay yes for both so we came up and started looking at houses and I actually had an interview the same day that we were scheduled to come up and look at houses so I was able to do that in person got notified probably a month and a half later that they had chosen me after doing a series of tests, you know, the background and all that kind of stuff. And my husband and I had put in an offer the day we came up here to look at houses and came back home, put our house up for sale. And then I decided to, I had to wait till I was 50 to retire from Anaheim, which happened to be just a month away. So, um, they let me finish out my time at Anaheim. And then I came up here and started a brand new job five days after I moved here. That was a little stressful. They were like, oh, you have to start. I said, um, really? Because I just moved here. I'd like to unpack at least a little bit. So, but uh, I started. Your husband could do and, that. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I'd really like to at least get, I'm pretty type A. So I got most of my stuff un unpacked and everything done, but it would have been nice to have a full week of just getting ready to start a new job. So 
Um, my job started with the DA's office as a management analyst working on this marijuana grant. And then within six months, they changed me over to the Deschutes County Sheriff as still as a management analyst because the sheriff really handles all the funds for this grant. So it just made more sense to have me on their payroll instead of on the DA's office because I'm out here to it's not a secret location, but it's a separate building called CODE, which is Central Oregon Drug Enforcement Team. And I am partnered up with, I'm supposed to be partnered up with two DCSO sheriff's deputies and then one Ben PD detective. And unfortunately, just due to some staffing challenges and stuff, we are just down to one Deschutes County Sheriff's Officer who's uh, the detective working on marijuana. And he actually came out with me to IACA and we did a presentation on working illegal marijuana grows. And so I'm kind of off location. I don't have a whole lot to do with the sheriff's office. Every once in a while, I'll go over there and everyone says, um, do you work here? I have to show my badge pretty much every time, but it's a different kind of environment than a police department going to the sheriff's. But so far, I have to say everyone has been so friendly here. It's been a really good experience, quite honestly. Now, is there any concern that it is a grant position? Because those can be specific time frames. So is there any concern there on your part about, you know, you've moved up for a grant position? Yes and no. For the most part, we moved here because my husband wanted to move. He was already retired. So even if I lost this job, he was ready to get out of California anyway. Mm -hmm. We aren't really relying on this job so much financially, just based on the fact that he retired and I retired from California and housing prices are less than California here. So I took that into consideration. And I think that's honestly why they hired me too. besides <laughs> I was the only trained analyst that applied. They also knew that they weren't going to hurt me too much financially if they couldn't keep me. Sure. So the first grant, I was done in six months. We re-upped it for another two years, and now we are re-upping it for another two years. But I had a discussion with the sheriff, and he said, no matter what happens now, I don't care about the funding. I'm going to keep you on board. So nice. that was nice. Yeah, I'm like, okay, so apparently the detectives are happy enough with me that they told him, she needs to stay. So he said, absolutely no worries on your job. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to make that leap a little bit and just make it your own, but it's scary stuff. I can imagine to move into a different state, not knowing the, the long-term prospects. Absolutely. And I, you know, I've known people who have done it and it, most of the time it has worked out for them. They've been able to show their value. And so they've been kept on but I have also heard of positions where they just couldn't find the funding. And unfortunately, that person could not be kept. And so, yeah, it is a leap of faith. But sometimes if you're trying to also get into the crime analysis field and there aren't a lot of jobs out there, maybe you've been able to find, sometimes you have to take that leap and just see if it works out for you, because at least you get that experience. And that's something that a lot of employers are looking for is experience. I'm Chris Cruz, and I'm here to tell you that as an analyst, you need to make sure you're managing your calendar. You got to be where you say you're going to be. You got to be available. You got to be ready to call, ready to respond at a moment's notice. Happy anniversary, Ayalia. International Association of Law Enforcement Intelligence Analysts turns 40 this year. LEA Podcast is proud to produce a series of panel podcasts dedicated to the IALEA anniversary. We are going over training, chapters, and certification. We'll talk about the past, and we'll talk about the future. So join us on Wednesdays as we celebrate 40 years of IALEA. Marijuana was legalized in Oregon in 2016, but one of your major assignments up there is to deal with marijuana legalization issues. So what are the issues that you're dealing with? Well, in our county, we, well, in our state, we had so many people become recreational growers, legal. You can have producers, you can have wholesalers, you can have recreational shops where you actually go and buy it. So you have people who just specifically grow and then they can sell to the 
recreational shops. It's a very lucrative industry, it does come with a lot of taxes and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, I think, 17% for the state and then 3% for the city. So you are paying quite a bit of taxes, probably more than some of the other items out there that you can get a business license for. And so it's not a cheap endeavor. So we have seen that there are a lot of people here in Deschutes County that are growing illegal marijuana and selling it across state lines. For the most part, it's going across state lines into the states that don't have it legalized, or they're selling it locally for cheaper than what you could get in a local dispensary. The big issue with that, though, is how they grow this stuff. The legal producers have a lot of laws and environmental concerns that they have to follow. Pesticides, obviously, are not good for human beings, and so it's very minimal what they can use to keep their, their crops healthy and still be okay for consumption for people. Unfortunately, our illegal grows don't really care about that. <laughs> they are there for profit, so the amount of insecticides and pesticides and stuff that we have found at some of these grows is definitely not something I would want to smoke and put into my lungs. So that's a concern, not to mention because you can only buy a marijuana product when you are 21 or older, we have a lot of these people selling to kids. And then they're selling the vape liquid, which is if it's unregulated, they're putting that vitamin E in there, it's burning people's lungs. And so there's a lot of issues with trying to stop these people from A, hurting people with the pesticides. Selling to kids is a big thing that our sheriff and our chief of police here do not want to see. And also it's money laundering. And now we're starting to see cartels. We just did a huge cartel grow two weeks ago, 49 greenhouses, almost 10,000 plants. And the living conditions of the immigrants that they had on this property was despicable. Oh. Um, it was it was really hard to see. They were brought up there. Some of them came voluntarily, but several of them were brought up there by coyotes to work off their time for getting across the border. And if you've just seen how they lived, it was, it was very sad. Uh, a lot of us were very angry at how these people were being treated. And unfortunately, it's even more so in Southern Oregon. They're seeing huge cartel grows and they, and they just can't even keep up with it. So it's definitely a problem here. We don't have any great solutions. On a personal note, uh, this is definitely not my sheriff's opinion. He is very anti-marijuana and I understand why. But I think not having it legal throughout the entire country allows the illicit market to be even more so than it would be if we just had federal rules, everyone was working under the same page, just think it would make it easier or just not having it legal at all. Because honestly, every state that we've talked to that has legalized it is seeing huge issues. Okay. So what states around you have not legalized it? Idaho is definitely oh, okay. not on board with that. So a, a lot goes there. A lot of our stuff goes to Florida oh. and to New York. <laughs> <laughs> Florida is huge. We have people actually from out of state coming and buying property here, and then they are cultivating this and then sending it back to their contacts in their original state. So they already have people kind of set up and ready to start selling their product. We've seen the Carolinas are also a, a place that we have a lot of it going to, but directly close to us would be Idaho. And Idaho has absolutely no tolerance for it. And it's actually hard to even drive hemp through that state, even though that's legal, because they just don't trust anyone driving that because they're not <laughs> sure if it's marijuana or not. That's fascinating. I actually thought most of the West Coast now had been legalized. I didn't realize it was still illegal in Idaho. I mean, it's also fascinating the distance, right? You're talking about East Coast with Carolina and Florida. I mean, that's a long way to move product. It is a long way. And it's interesting how they've figured out how to do it besides, you know, normal cars and stuff like that. We had one case where they were packing marijuana into art, into frames of artwork and sending it out. So yeah, they're very creative on how they get this across state lines of, you know, they'll rent cars, they'll rent trucks. We've heard of them flying it. I'm not so sure because we haven't been able to prove that. I don't disagree with it. I just, we have to be able to prove it. Uh, just very clever ways. Like I said, they use the postal service. And as long as they can not have that smell come through, the postal service has no idea. I mean, FedEx and 
UPS and however they can hide it, they do it. So it, it's kind of interesting. And they also, I don't know if you've ever heard of BHO, it's called butane honey oil. It's something that is a byproduct of cooking marijuana and getting the liquid THC and stuff. And then you can make it into what they call dabs or something like that. And it's, it's a small, it's a small amount with a, a huge punch. And so you can send those out because they're a lot smaller than trying to obviously do just raw marijuana. And then they can melt that and use that in a whole different way. So in BHO is mm -hmm very illegal here if you do not do that with the lab because we've had houses blow up, people injured. It is a very technical process and it's very flammable. And if you don't know what you're doing, you could definitely get injured. So can you and or the detectives tell if the marijuana that has been grown legally versus the marijuana that's been grown illegally? Our state has a metric system just like Colorado does and I believe Washington does and so all of our dispensaries have to be marked from the time it's grown to the time it's sent to all the different handlers I guess you would call them and then to the dispensary. So when you buy a product, it has a record of where it was grown, where it was moved, who drove it. I mean, it goes through all the different processes. Is it perfect? No. Uh, one of my detectives actually was the one who figured out that the metric system wasn't catching some of these people who say that they're destroying their product. Like, let's say it didn't come out or it tested hot for pesticides or something like that. You have to get rid of that. You cannot sell that. So they put it into the system that they're disposing of it. Well, the detective Andrew from Ben PD discovered that this one legal dispensary was getting rid of more than they were actually selling. So he obviously figured out that that <laughs> was a problem. And so they were using this supposed waste and they were selling it out the back door. So mm -hmm. that is a challenge to find, though. We really rely on OLCC. They are Liquor and Cannabis Commission to make sure that our legal businesses are following the practices. We think most of them are, but of course, you, you know, we have some bad actors in there, but our most of our work is truly on these people living in the middle of our residential areas who are growing marijuana and disrupting the quality of life for the people who live near them. Yeah, trying to get around that 20% sales tax. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I get it. I do, I do get it. I, it's got to be a little frustrating to deal with. You should see the amount of regulations are under far more than most businesses. But again, if you're going to do business and sell your product, you got to follow the rules or eventually somebody will catch up with you. But we've found most of our dispensaries are, are honest and hardworking people who are supplying jobs to people. And so unless we really have something good on them, we let them uh, do their, their business and OLCC focuses and we focus on the others. Think of the idea of legalizing marijuana and you're, and you're thinking like, oh, okay, that's one less thing that law enforcement has to deal with. And it just seems like what you just described to me that their law enforcement is just as busy with marijuana now as it was 10 years ago. Yeah. I never honestly would have thought about it as a citizen who was like, whatever, if they legalize it, same thing I thought okay, we'll get, it'll become the norm like alcohol or other things and we won't have to worry about it as much. But I am really quite amazed at how many illegal grows are out there. And a big part of it is because it doesn't cost a ton of money to set these up. Well, if you do it well, it costs some money. So the cartels and some of these people, they put this stuff together and they are making anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000 a pound for this. Mm -hmm. So the investment is really small compared to what you can get. So they're willing to risk it. Um, that's what I, I had no idea until I got into this. And who knew I was going to work marijuana? I mean, that was <laughs> never somewhere I thought that my career would go, but it's really quite interesting. I'm learning a lot. Um, but yeah, I, as a citizen, I, I never would have envisioned this. And even as law enforcement, I honestly did not see this as being such a big issue as it is now. 
let's move on to some advice you have for our audience now. One of the questions I like to ask is about return on investment. So these are items that analysts can study today that may be important five, 10 years down the road. So what are, what's some advice that you have that folks should be studying today? Well, obviously, if we keep legalizing marijuana in state by state, that's something people need to start paying attention to because uh, they're it's going to come their way. Mm-hmm. The other thing I've really seen an increase in just in, you know, reading bulletins and following some of this information is how many protests we are experiencing as a society, whether it is social justice or shootings or upset about a law or people are just very verbal compared to back in the day, you would always have protests, but not like this, not that has become so violent and angry and law enforcement is having to deal with that more and more. And even though I'm in a small area, we, we had some issues over last summer not this summer, last summer, you know, for the social justice and some of it got a little violent and a gun was pulled. And this is a really small area. It's just not something we would have expected. So I think analysts really need to keep up on what's going on in their area and and make sure that their supervisors or command staff is really aware of what's going on so they're not caught shorthanded. You know, I remember being at Anaheim when we had a, a, a big civil unrest, as they call it, but riot, whatever you want to call it. And really, Anaheim had never dealt with that before, not at that level. And so not being prepared kind of hurt them. Now, I know Anaheim is, you know, a 100 times prepared for that. So I just think analysts can really help with a lot of that stuff, just kind of knowing what's going on in the area and and listening to some of the dialogue that people are having of things they're upset with. So that would be my suggestion for people. And I had a couple of guests that wanted to talk about their analytical role in times of protest, but their department didn't want them to talk about it on air. And I, and I get it. This is an open source data that other folks can get a hold of. So I, I get it, but I was really looking forward to that because that is an, an interesting topic of what is the analyst role in a protest situation. Yeah. And it's, a, it's kind of amazing how much analysis has grown as far as the different positions now that people are doing. We're not just crunching numbers or even just looking for suspects. We're involved in a lot more than that now, just as far as working with community problems and protests and just more of the social media and keeping on top of this stuff. And so I think the analyst job has really expanded, which is great because it's more job opportunities, but it's just, it becomes almost impossible to be just a general analyst if you're dealing with a lot of this other stuff. So having some of these specialized positions is almost necessary if you're in an area like Portland where, my God, every day there's some kind of protest. So, (laughs) you know, it's, it's a definite opportunity though for growth for our profession, which is great to see. Yeah. Thinking out loud about the the issue and certainly uh, I'm probably going to come off as, as fairly naive, but I'm surprised that there's not more laws clearly distinguishing between rioting and protesting because there seems to be a fairly clear line between the two, right? We have the, certainly the right as citizens to protest, but the damaging of property or the violence, that is a clear line to rioting. I'm really surprised that more states or even, you know, nationally, we haven't made the distinction between rioting and protesting. And yeah, I agree because we, like I said, we had the incident in our city and we're completely fine with people speaking their, their mind. I mean, as long as they're doing it, you know, where they're not blocking traffic or getting in other people's faces you know, no one has an issue with that, but with ours, they did the block the traffic or police officers really couldn't get out and respond to some issues. And so they got cited for that. And then the DA's office wouldn't file on that. And so it's, it's a little discouraging for the officers and then for citizens too, of how far can you take your protesting? I mean, obviously we have laws for assault and vandalism and all that stuff, but you're right. I don't think we're using some of those laws in the appropriate manner. I also get, you know, just asking you to leave. And then when you don't, we don't need to use force and stuff like that. But you also have to look at 
are you impeding other people from getting to work or a fire department getting to a call or a police officer getting to a call? And if so, that could be a danger to somebody else. So yeah, I think it's probably something that our country is going to face more and more and different areas are going to come up with different laws to deal with this, I think. Even though we do have a, a lot on the books, we don't seem to be using them very well. You know, another question I like to ask folks is, you know, when you look back at your career, you know, you've been doing this for 23 years. Is there anything that you think back of, like when you first started that like, oh, by the time 2021 comes around, you know, law enforcement analysis will have this figured out. And yet we're still dealing with the same old issue today as we were back 23 years ago. Yeah, I would have hoped that we would have come farther with IT. Um, So many analysts struggle with just getting data on the back end, you know, just a simple ODBC connection. I have found it here. I, I feel like every time I go to a different department, it is the same thing over and over again, trying to get data. You're asked a lot by a command staff, and yet they really just don't understand that the data in the RMS is not necessarily clean. And so you want to look at it in a mass dump and make sure that you're actually giving accurate information out. And to me, to be in 2021 and still having to have this fight with the RMS companies, with your IT department, and just getting people to understand that we're not going to mess with the data. We just want to use it so we can give you the best possible answer to the question you have. And I just, I, I honestly cannot believe that we're still so far behind on that in so many police departments because it's, I hear it from so many analysts and it's, it's very frustrating. Yeah. And I actually think the pandemic last year being shut down last year actually moved us forward years because folks had to work from home and they got VPN and they got access that they probably never had before in a laptop computer. And they realized that they could do that and they could have that access and which they probably, it would have probably taken another five or 10 years for their department to give them that access. But because of the situation that we were in last year, now they have that access. So I'm, I am actually hoping that it does open up and analysts are given more access to backend data. Yeah, I agree. Um, I definitely think more people got access to data or just a computer to work at home that they never had before. I had that at Anaheim and that was only because the captain, he needed stuff and I happened to be sick and I was like, okay, I it's I don't want to be at work obviously when I'm sick, but I know you need this stuff done. And so he had been super ill himself and finally got IT to set him up so he could work remotely. So he said, okay, that's it. I'm getting you a computer so you can work at home because obviously I need, sometimes I need stuff. And if you're not here, I, I I'm hoping if you're not too sick, you can provide it to me. So I I was lucky in that. And then the two analysts later that I hired, they both got take home laptops too, so that they could work. And it was extremely helpful, especially if maybe someone's out in the field and they need your help and you just don't have access to your computer at work. Because there was a few times before I had that, I had to drive in and go get the data. So you're right. I think that definitely opened up eyes. I don't have a laptop here, actually. Funny enough, uh, everybody else does. <laughs> I have just uh, my desktop. But what's great is, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of people weren't around. So I could work by myself and not actually have to work about, you know, worry about getting anyone else's germs or anything. So yeah. the few times I had to work from home, I copied a lot of stuff on a thumb drive and did some stuff. But I'm going to push for a laptop because every once in a while I'm getting contacted on the weekend and I just don't have access. So, but I'm, I'm going to be an optimist like you, Jason, and hope that this moved (laughs) us a little bit more forward. Yeah. Let's talk about the IECA now. And as I mentioned in your intro, you, uh, you're currently the co-chair of the conference speaker committee. And I think it's an interesting time to talk to you now because we're uh, just a month or so out of the conference. You know, you're just, uh, all right, you're planning for next year mode, right? We're in Chicago next year, and you're taking the evals from this year's conference and trying to come up with the lineup for next year. Is that right? It is. And, you know, honestly, we got a lot of good feedback on our speakers, which we were very happy to see. 
you know, you can't please everyone and we get that. And sometimes, you know, you got to give a chance to an analyst who's never presented before. And honestly, a lot of them just knocked it out of the park. And that was great to see because you want to try and give new people opportunities to speak. I mean, obviously we can't do it with everyone. We have to keep, you know, trying each year to pick different topics, pick new speakers. We of course have speakers that we've used in the past that have always gotten great reviews. So we can't ignore that either. But yeah, next year is not that far away. Um, <laughs> when you're planning a conference, Albert can tell you just how stressful that is. So we're already going to start planning for that. And hopefully we can get something out ahead of time. I think we were just a little rushed with COVID this year sure. to maybe again, get people's opinions on what type of classes that they are interested in. You know, you have, I guess, our members need to speak up on what they want to see. And then also we have to have people who are willing to present though, too. I mean, access is something I always loved and you just don't have a lot of people who can present that or want to, or they're presenting on something else. And so we have different topics that I think are always good, but you know, you have to have people willing to do it. And I think the pandemic, obviously, a lot of people did not want to travel or couldn't travel. So we'll see how Chicago goes, but we're always interested in people's opinions. And if they think they've seen a great class somewhere else at another conference, reach out to us because we, we get a lot of referrals from people, honestly. And so we'll reach out to those people to see if they want to do something. I watched the, the NORCAN one, which I'm a member of. It's up here in northern part of the western United States, so Oregon, Washington, and they had a virtual conference, and I saw a couple of their speakers and reached out and said, oh, you know, they were really good, so we're always looking for people to tell us somebody that we may not know about or who is too shy to mm -hmm. put in and thinks that they aren't a good presenter, but somebody else thinks they are. That happens a lot, too. I know a lot of people who actually are extremely bright and great analysts, but they're afraid to do public speaking. So if you're one of those, try it. You never know. Yeah. I think that, geez, it seems to me it's just the topics, right? It seems like identifying for the folks that are going to attend next year in Chicago, identifying the topics that they want to see. And that is really difficult in my opinion, because number one, you don't know who's going to show up and you're not going to know who's going to show up until after you've already made the decision on what topics and the schedule and all that. So it's, it's really difficult to know. You, you always use past conference surveys, but you know, you could have something and people tell you from a survey in Vegas what they want to see and none of them show up in Chicago next year. And then the people of Chicago would be like, oh, I don't, I'm not interested in that topic, even though you just got told from the Vegas conference goers that that's what they want to see. Yeah, you're right. That is a challenge because we will have people who tell us what they want to see, but like you said, they don't show up for the conference. And so, especially with COVID, we had no idea if we were how many people we were going to get. It was actually a little scary thinking, oh my God, are we going to get towards the end of this and really not have a lot of attendees? Mm -hmm. And of course it hurt our international community because most of them couldn't even travel to get here. And, and we want to be inclusive with them and make sure that we are including classes that they can teach and that they can go to and learn something different than just, you know, the people from the United States. Um, but that was obviously a challenge. So you're right. I encourage our members to really reach out and say, I do plan or at least try to come to the IACA conference. And this is what I would love to see. And I think that would help us a lot because we do the best we can with what is submitted to us and go from there. Maybe a, a good idea would be to send out a survey to our members and say, I know it's early, but for those mm -hmm. of you who are planning for next year, do you think you can make it to Chicago? Is that even something that your agency would allow you to do? And yeah. that's part of it too, is a lot of agencies don't allow their analysts to travel. So it would be, yeah. be good to know how many people think they're going to at least attempt to get to our conference. Yeah, here's an idea. And I know this is, gets beyond your pay grade with the association, quote unquote. Maybe this is something we can run past Albert. 
what if you had early registration for the conference and you gave a discount for that early registration? You get those early registration and you ask them, okay, you, you, we know you're coming to the conference. What are some things you want to see? And then that way you at least have some idea of some folks that are coming, what topics they want to see. Even if you left just maybe a couple of sessions here and there dedicated to that instead of having the whole schedule, I understand that might be kind of difficult. If you could do that, you might have a, a better chance of getting some good feedback for those that are actually going to the conference. And that's definitely a good idea. I mean, we do do early registration, but maybe not early enough. And we do give a discount if you register by a certain time. We didn't do that this year. We just wanted whoever could attend to attend. Mm -hmm. We try and get our speakers picked probably by end of May. I mean, that is the absolute latest that we try and do that because we also get feedback from our analysts that say, I can't come to the conference until I know what's on the schedule. So um, that's also a challenge when you have people telling us, my administration won't send me unless there's something they think would benefit the police department, which okay. is a challenge too, because you know we get people who say they want to speak and most of them follow through, but sometimes people have family emergencies, they're ill, uh, their agency has decided to pull them back. And so then mm -hmm. we've got to figure out how to scramble and get those speakers. So it's not a bad idea though, to maybe even get even earlier registration out there. And when we do have them write in, what are you interested in seeing? That That's actually something I think maybe we could do. But like you said, I'm not in charge. <laughs> so Albert would need to make that decision. Do you remember if is the conference in August or September next year? It, it used to always be in September, but now mm. it is, I believe it's in August again. So okay. I, they're sticking with August for yeah. a lot of its, you know, cost reasons and also, you know, availability of some of these hotels too. So yeah, May is that's, you know, you're looking about June, July, August, that's only three months if, if you're just making that decision at the end of May for what's, what's in the conference. So yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge, and it, it's funny how there's like the chicken or the egg, you know, thing there that some folks won't be able to sign up until they know what's in there, and yet you're trying to figure out what to put on as topics without having anybody registered. So that's a interesting challenge. Uh, it definitely is. So hopefully, you know, COVID will go away. <laughs> So we can make it a little bit easier for us to do this next year. Yeah. You know, it was great getting out there and it was great being in Vegas. And I haven't heard anything. If you've heard anything, I, you know, we're a couple of weeks out. I have not heard of anybody that's gotten sick from the conference. Not that I know every single person that went to the conference, but have not heard anything like that. We had that conference. We had, what, 300-ish analysts out there certainly try to do our best with social distancing and wearing masks and, and whatnot. But hey, it, it wasn't perfect. But at the same time, I haven't heard of anybody going home and, and being sick, which is fantastic. That is fantastic. And yeah, I don't know of anybody either. And again, they may just not let us know. And hopefully mm -hmm. people didn't get sick or if they did, it was a minor case of something. But yeah, I mean, as you said, we did the best we could and it's not fun wearing a mask all day. I get it, but you know, you have to do it if you're going to make things work. And I have something I'm going to next week. And again, we have to wear masks the whole time, but otherwise they're not going to have it. And so if we want training, we got to do this. And there is a little bit of risk involved, of course, but hopefully everyone stayed safe and healthy and we didn't have too much of an issue. And I really didn't see anyone pushing back and getting upset about the masks. And obviously we're all adults. And if anyone felt uncomfortable, uh, they could sit far away from other people and not attend anything that was too busy or something. And so hopefully people did that because we wanted a good experience for people. Yeah, I agree. Well, our last segment to the show is words to the world. And this is where I give the, la the guest the last word. Danielle, what are your words to the world? Um, number one, be kind. Two, do the best you can at your job. No one expects miracles, but I would say be available, be open to listening. That's not always been my strong suit, and I think I'm getting better as I get older. But listen and and really do the best you can to help your your coworkers or anyone around you that needs your assistance. 
Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. <laughs> but I do appreciate you being on the show, Danielle. Thank you so much and you be safe. Thank you so much for having me and you be safe too. And we'll be talking again. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to the Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.
is so funny. Like, who knows what he is now, right? He's oh, probably, yeah. He's probably like, some big chief security officer somewhere. For like Amazon. <laughs> was it craft, like actual, the word craft, or was like craft with a K or something like that? It was craft with a C. Yeah. So, craft, if you're listening to this, reach, reach out. out. <laughs> Email LEA podcast <laughs> at gmail.com. Yeah. But but don't hack me, please. Please. Oh, that's good stuff there. So well, I, I do want to ask you about training. I, I see on your resume here that you have a variety of training. Is there a particular training that you really like that you would recommend to our listeners? If I think back of you know my law enforcement and intelligence training in particular, there were two courses that I always look back and honestly, just loved. I just thought they were the most interesting, most fun courses I took. Um, the first one was uh, the Internet Investigations Training course, uh, which is held by Fletzy. And it's a, it's a two-week course down at their campus. Uh, and it's awesome. They, they hook you up with a computer and everything to take with you when you leave. Uh, they give you a thumb drive filled with all kinds of software to do internet investigations. Um, it's, it was just an awesome course with tons of hands-on experience. Uh, and it's super um, beginner friendly. So you don't have to be super technical to take the course and, and learn a lot from it, which I really appreciated. The other course I took, it was right when I started with State Police. It, it was literally my, my second or third week on the job. They had an opening for an uh, OSINT a practitioner course. So it's Open Source Intelligence Practitioner course by DHS. One of my bosses came over and was like, hey, we got this seat open. Like we've already paid for it. Someone's got to sit in it. Can you go sit in its course for a week? <laughs> and I was like, okay, sure. I'm the new guy. I'll do whatever you say, right? So I sat in the course. It was amazing. It's probably one of the best OSINT courses I ever took. Again, tons of really uh, practical knowledge. They, made, they actually made you take like a, a practical test at the end where they, they give you this booklet and you have to go through all these questions um, and, and test out your OSINT skills. That was kind of like my first taste of, of OSINT as a, as a, a practice, I guess, um, as, a, as a skill. Before that, I thought it was just, you know, Facebook stalking. So <laughs> it was really cool to see that there was like a, a trade craft to it for me. And just the way they did the course, I just thought was was really awesome. So it's one I definitely recommend. All right. Very good. Well, I'll put links into the show notes again for those two training classes if you're interested. All right. Well, let's take some calls now. Let's uh, go on to Don't Be That Analyst. I actually have a Don't Be That Analyst. And probably this is why I was so excited to do Don't Be That Analyst today. Recently, I emailed a coworker. I said, hey, I need this information mapped. I made a table in Outlook. I said, here's the information I need. And I made a blank column to the right on the table to fill in. I was expecting this typed, returned to me in an email. What the employee did was printed out the email wrote down in that column what the mapping was, scanned it in, and then emailed it back to me. Wow. And that so is, that is definitely a don't be that analyst. I don't know how the straightforward way of telling you don't be that analyst that without telling that story, but that is a definitely don't be that analyst. That, does. <laughs> that is a, a fascinating level of effort to solve a very simple request. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how about you? Do you have a don't be that analyst? Yes. I will say for me, don't be that analyst who doesn't use spell check. And I feel like I shouldn't have to say that, but I have seen it way more times than I should. I once saw uh, an analyst email go out that was so horribly riddled with spelling errors and grammatical errors that someone called me thinking that we had been hacked and were sending out phishing emails. <laughs> so ever since then, they tell everyone, please, you know, for the love of God, you just hit the button and use the spell check. Oh, yeah, that's that's interesting. So, yeah, and actually a little Outlook tip, you can actually turn on spell check to where when, after you hit send, it'll go through spell check with you. Correct, you can, and, yes. And you can set that up so in case you forget to do spell check on an email, it'll automatically do it for you. Yes, so, that's an awesome tip. Yeah, so, all right, well, let's uh, take some calls then and see what we get into. First on the line is nate nate what is your don't be that analyst um don't be that analyst that assesses facts you should never assess facts you should always have be assessing uh, where you can make a judgment i think that's fascinating i never really thought about it that way assessing 
facts because i guess facts are stuff that you're are to assume are true so you shouldn't be necessarily analyzing facts but what i guess what is your take on that yeah i mean i think it you, it feels like one of those things that's like so obvious you you wouldn't have to say it but listening to him say it it does make sense and I, i'm sure myself have been have been guilty of injecting some some level of opinion or, or providing you know, an analyst insight on something that really could have or should have just been stated as a plain fact and just left at that. Yeah. I guess with today, there's so much quote unquote facts or truth out there. <laughs> we kind of got in the habit of questioning all the facts and the truth, right? <laughs> it seems odd to say, don't judge facts. All right. Next on the line is Todd. Todd, what's your don't be that analyst? Hey, Jason. I would just say, don't be that analyst that kind of hangs on to an old report that maybe you manually produce. It takes up a chunk of your day just because, you know, it's what you're comfortable doing all the time. I just encourage analysts to think of something new, uh, learn something new and improve your product and bring something new to the table in your department. Yeah, they can uh, write a script like you did, right? <laughs> Yeah. I love this this one because I'm a huge proponent. Um, I learned this in the private sector, which is stop doing work that doesn't matter. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many people are holding on to some ancient monthly or weekly report that nobody likes and nobody wants to read and everyone hates it. Um, you can just retool it or rebuild it or change it up, probably make everyone happier. Yeah, that reminds me. I had this report that I had to do at Cincinnati Police Department. And I tried my best to automate that report because I hated to do it. It was all this data sources that come in. And of course, there was always one. It wasn't on the system. It wasn't in our data warehouse anywhere. It was just something that somebody emailed over to us. And it was just so annoying to have to try to get this all together. I probably could have used your script. I wish I knew you back then. <laughs> but it was so annoying that I hated I hated putting that thing thing together. And I tried really hard to get rid of it because I thought it was the juice wasn't worth the squeeze in terms of the information that was on there. But it was something that we always did. So they wanted to see it kind of thing. So I never did get out of it. All right. Next on the line is Brian. Brian, what's your don't be that analyst? Don't be the analyst who puts their department badge or logo on their flyer in more than one place. I guess if you're particularly proud of your department, <laughs> you uh, might want to put it on multiple areas. It's kind of funny. These Some of these don't be that analyst. They're obviously very personal and they've <laughs> obviously seen this. So apparently Brian has seen it where there was just a, a factor memo sent out that plastered with the department logo yeah sounds like brian is responding to a very specific incident he encountered yeah I'm trying to think of where, where you would you even do it more than once i mean usually you have letterhead right mm -hmm. that you might see it up at, up at the top and even in a powerpoint you might have it shadowed in the background mm -hmm. where it was but it seems like it was multiple times and multiple sizes all <laughs> all throughout the, the report so wow. it's it's funny Next on the line is Jamie. Jamie, what's your don't be that analyst? Don't be that analyst who uses cutesy little cats, dogs, rabbits, symbols on your map. It's not cute. Uh, yeah, I would definitely say that for our profession. Yeah, I think, that's, that. I think that's a, a good rule to live by. Yeah. Probably almost any time you're making a map. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, if you work for PetSmart, <laughs> maybe that works. And it's funny, I can't even imagine see, putting some of that because usually this, I have trouble seeing most of the, the symbols on a map. You know, that's probably old man elder talking. So if, whether I what, was like a, a cat, I, I probably wouldn't be able to even tell a symbol on the map unless it's ginormous. I probably wouldn't even be able to tell that it's a, a cat or a dog or a rabbit. Yeah, really. But definitely it goes, it's good advice to know your audience and not to get too cute. And then lastly is Michael. Michael, what you don't be that Alice? Don't be that analyst that tries to solve every case that comes their way. The reason is the cases are so fluid and the detectives are getting a lot more information than you are sitting behind the computer. So give them what they need. Give them a little bit more, but don't try to solve the case. It's going to save you some headaches and it's going to save you a lot of work. 
this is an interesting thought because you never know how far to go. And I, even with you working in a fusion center, I know you'll, how many databases should you search on stuff? How many, how far down the rabbit hole should you be searching on and going through? It's interesting because sometimes I know as an analyst, I was criticized, well, you just did what you were asked for and then you were done. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's what they asked me to do. And, and he did say, try to do a little bit more, but it, you know, I'm going to need way more information if they want me to have a bigger impact on the investigation. So it can be difficult to judge when is the right opportunity to just give them what they're asking for versus doing the, a full court press and trying to get at further details of the case so you can be more helpful. Yeah, I, for me, this one feels almost like a, a personal attack because I am mm -hmm. the king of probably over-delivering way more or, or at least trying to over-deliver more than I should. I'm definitely that person who thinks I'm going to, I'm going to solve this one. I'm going to crack this one. Uh, even in private sector, you know, get a case and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to make this one gold. I'm going to, I'm going to work this one to the bone. I'm definitely that guy who thinks every case is, could be like the breaking one, the big one. So this one, this one hits close home for me. It's a weird give and take, especially when you're starting, especially when you're new, a new analyst to know exactly how the standard operating procedure is going to be because it'll vary from detective to detective and unit to unit yeah totally all right well let's finish with personal interests i see you have on here urban art and graffiti <laughs> which gets back into your high school days i guess <laughs> right with skulls and crossbones uh, i guess so yeah i guess it all it all comes full circle <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big fan. So I live in the city in Richmond. I'm definitely like a, a city person. <laughs> I like city living for sure. Um, and I'm just a big fan of, you know, Richmond has a, a very vibrant art scene, um, uh, annual, you know, murals that go up every year and, and vibrant street art scene. And I'm just kind of a, a purveyor of it all. I actually kind of keep an Instagram account where I just share graffiti and street art pictures that I find, you know, throughout the city. Is that legal urban art or is this uh, <laughs> illegal? I mean, I'm, I am art. just a uh, chronicle of the urban art. I'm not a creator at all. I assume, yeah. you know, it's mixed. Some of it is, yeah. some of the bigger murals and stuff are certainly approved and, and, and sometimes even paid for. Uh, but some of the other stuff is definitely just traditional old graffiti, you know, people doing stuff they're not supposed to do. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I find it fascinating with graffiti artists or the urban artists. It's like even the amateurs, I mean, they take their craft seriously and they'll only use certain spray paint or certain materials. It doesn't seem like there's anyone that's actually an amateur. And I mean, obviously there's gang and symbols and some of that conversation back and forth and crossing out symbols and whatnot. But for the most part, when it comes to some of these more complicated urban artwork, there's a craft there. Yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of, you know, I guess for lack of a better word, passion that, that they mm -hmm. put into it. And probably what set me down this this path was the time I spent doing gang intelligence at the Fusion Center and staring at graffiti from all over the state for hours on end, sometimes just trying to read whatever the hell it was supposed to say, uh, but oftentimes just trying to determine, you know, did it have a gang nexus of, of any type at all? Yeah, there is this whole, just like I talked about with, you know, the, the hacking groups, you know, there there is this whole va uh, a fascinating subculture in graffiti and street art where, you know, if you, when you talk about people who are who are less skilled or maybe not good artists, you know, those are called toys. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you, if you ever see, you know, someone's art scratched out with the word "toy" next to it, that's a that's a grave insult. Those are fighting words in the graffiti yeah. world. Oh wow! That reminds me too. Just a quick tip: your city planning or parks and rec also have data, also have databases. And so some of this graffiti or a lot of information that they, they collect might be in some of these databases. And so you may have access to some, get access to some of this information. And that's a, some more Intel databases that may be available for you within your own city. So that's definitely something to check out because uh, it's not like they're, they're all going to call the police and get a record of every single bit of graffiti that's in the city. Yeah, that's a great call out. You know, they always say, you know, graffiti is kind of the newspaper of the street. So it is a, it's an interesting data point to monitor. My last question is deals with words of the world. And Chris, this is when I give the 
the guests the last word. So what are your words to the world? Yeah, I think, you know, my parting thoughts are in some form, in some way, you know, strive to be a technologist. You don't have to be, you know, an expert. You don't have to be a a programmer. You don't have to be a a hacker artist or anything (laughs) quite like that. Uh, But just strive to be the person who advocates for solving problems with technology, the person who advocates for considering the risks and threats from technology, and the person who advocates for just making life easier with technology when the options are there. I think I said it before, but I'll say it again. I think law enforcement analysts and and all kinds of analysts are in that unique role to to play the technologist aspect in their offices. And we probably aren't going to see that coming from a lot of sworn guys and, and girls. So um, it really falls on the analyst to pick up that that torch sometimes. Okay. Well, I leave every guest with you. giving me just enough to talk bad about you later. <laughs> but I do appreciate you being on the show, Chris. Thank you so much. And you be safe. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to the Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also, thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.